guys. Welcome to this edition of Scott's Podcast Series. I am elated and privileged to have Troy Kirby on my podcast. You know, this is kind of like long awaited. I never was able to go on Troy's podcast because my employers never let me. And now I'm hosting my own podcast. Troy was the host of the Sports Dow for many years, and I was glued to it always the best sports biz professionals on it i would not miss an episode i don't think i've missed an episode of the troy kirby Dow of sports troy what is going on my man how you been well good um i will say that it, you were in a more precarious situation a lot of times um when i was and all of them were recorded while i was at uc davis a lot of times they were obtuse to it until they got annoyed by it but then they didn't know what to do about it so i just I just didn't care. So, I mean, I, I felt bad for Nona Richardson. She was on episode, I think, uh, 65. She was the senior associate at Davis and actually yeah. had a reprimand because she spoke out of turn, but she said good things about UC Davis, but that's the way UC Davis uh, kind of goes. So I always tell Nona once in a while, you know, I'm sorry, but she finds it funny. So, huh. you know, I'm, I'm doing great, but when you get those and you know, this is a good lesson for uh, those people out there that do live under those employers is those folks aren't going to help you long term. They are not going to be there and be solid when they say loyalty. It's not necessarily loyalty. It's uh, protection of their own ego as being the only mouthpiece. And a lot of times, you know, you just got to get out of those situations. Yeah, it is for sure. And, and Troy, you were really the first person, at least in the sports biz landscape, to, to start a podcast, really. And, and like I said, I was glued to it like everything. I got so much great insight. Obviously, I was younger back then and still learning the business and, and working for University of Illinois, Bowling Green, obviously went on to the secondary to event to like DTI management. Then I said, F it, screw the corporate world. I'm doing it myself, finally. What made you kind of like start the Dallas sports back then? I'm going to throw you off right away. Um, my friend, uh, Andrew Olette had a podcast called the nothing cast mm -hmm. and he, we were in Seattle. I was at uh, Eastern Washington university in the summer of 2012. And he said, Hey, I need you to come on because you can get somebody to talk. And I said, who is this? And he said, the Octomom, you know, that lady that had like eight kids. Apparently, he had secured the only uh, podcast or, you know, thing that she was going to do. And so we wound up uh, meeting in Tacoma, at, you know, some weird uh, type of location that she was signing books at. And so we talked and she, he was only supposed to get five minutes. And I got 55 minutes out of her because I did not talk about anything dirty. We talked about like, what's it like to be a mom? What's it like this way? And then after, as I was sitting there, I was going, well, why couldn't we do this for sports? I mean, not like, you know, the sensationalism, but, you know, I had always talked to people and called people up and asked them, hey, you know, what are you doing right? What, what's this? What's that? And then I was, so I started thinking, well, maybe there's an option. I had the equipment and I sat down and I was explaining this to Matt Harper, who was uh, leaving San Jose State. He was stopping by UC Davis. It was in the ticket office before one of the football games, about five hours. And he was going up to Oregon to start duct ticks. So he became my first one. He goes, just pop it on. I don't care. And so we just talked. And, you know, I think that's it hit it off. What was funny was when I put it up, I had a colleague that I still respect to this day, but called me immediately and said, take that down. You're going to destroy your career, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> a year and a half later, he was trying to do his own podcast. A lot of this stuff is if you haven't done it, you shouldn't be the one that starts it in their mind. You know, like that's, I think that's unfortunately the mindset, but you know, I've got to say there were a lot of things that I regret. I do not regret doing a podcast or blogs or anything else, because I think I would have been a lot more frustrated, especially as, you know, my days, uh, you know, at the last school I was at, you know, kind of went because they like to stifle creativity, but they, they don't like to, have it put out there and that's just not my style for sure and you know it's funny i remember that matt harper podcast like episode one like it was yesterday tune in to matt i hope he's doing well and diving right into ticketing obviously you're a ticketing guy director of ticket operations at uc davis for many years i mean obviously we, we've lived in a crazy world the last two years obviously with covid the pandemic what do you think of the state of, the, of ticketing it's just all over the place between the primary the secondary 
We have events at $6, obviously going into the college football playoffs. It's good because of matchups, but why is just everything so flux and unorganized more than ever in 2021? I think it's the, the people at the, you know, that are running it typically stop putting themselves in the shoes of the people who show up and why they show up. You know, um, I think a lot of times they just go, oh, great, we've got a game. They should want to be at this game. That means nothing to a lot of the folks. They're there for a casual time. So you have to figure out how to make it a casual experience that people want to go to. Because if you look, it's not the ticket sales that are really dropping. It's the ticket scan-ins that should be scary. The scan-ins are at like 26, 27%. I still follow this stuff. It's not like, you know, and it's like, they, you know, you can brag about, I'm up here in Seattle and they can brag about the, you know, the Seattle Kraken and, you know, how great it is, whatever. But you know, when the scan-ins are below, you know, 50%, that to me should be like frightening because that only takes a few times for people to say, I'm never, you know, a part of this again. And that doesn't just mean winning. I think that is uh, one of the misnomers that people have. You can have a really great product that does not win and, you know, still have a fun time. The winning is not, I mean, that's why I think uh, Manfred with uh, minor league baseball. Yeah, I mean, he's the commissioner of major league baseball, but they bought over minor league baseball and they're so focused on making minor league baseball into major league baseball that every team is going to be the Yankees or the Red Sox, you know, going down their little affiliation list. I'm going to tell you the reason the minor league survived was the fact that they did not focus on wins. Right. That has nothing to do with it. And when you focus on just finding baseball people, People go to baseball games all the time, but great. That's just not it. So, you know. Yeah, I mean, diving right more into baseball, too, obviously was a major topic in Scout Six throughout the summer and the fall and the $3 tickets that the Anaheim Angels, New York Yankees were doing from Rob Maffert's commissioner's office, from the marketing folks, the Tebow, they called a Major League Baseball. Major League Baseball is obviously in a lot of trouble. They're under lockout now. Do they play in 2022? Well, here's the question, even if they do. You know, the, the, the biggest issue that they've got still comes back to the fact of not too many seeds or whatever. It's just that I don't know that they make it an event. Mm -hmm. I go to a baseball game. It's a baseball game. I, that's why people went to minor league baseball games. None of it had to do with the, with the actual thing. I'm sorry, gearheads, which are the people that run and ruin everything, you know, they, they just don't understand. I, you know, and I can give you a, an example here locally, I started uh, the Lacey Pocket Gophers as more of a joke and it was my uh, soccer, it's, you know, but it's, it was only a little bit to start a team and they said, there's no way you'll get more than 30 people a game because blah, blah, blah. You know what? We had t-shirts thrown out, we had concessions, we had music during the game, we had all the stuff that they told us not to have, I'd get 350 people a game. There's mm -hmm. a reason, people want to have fun. It's people, have, the, the loss you know, uh, most sports is that they forgot how to have fun. That I'm sorry, it's not the Louvre. I don't need to. I don't need to sit there and respect the artwork. You know, and to me, that's that's where a lot of these people miss it. It's like you know, there's a reason that people watch Tiger King. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm sorry, you're not watching it to find out about Oklahoma Zoo rights. You're go you're going. This is more bizarre by the mo moment. I, this is great. I'm gonna see. You know, whatever. When you see other people, you know, like try to sell stuff, they try to sell it on basically what everybody else has, you know? I mean, it's got to be wild and zany. I've got to care. It has to be. And, you know, Troy, I mean, that, that's funny. I mean, minor league baseball, I don't talk about it enough on Scott Stakes, and I will head into 2022. But the creativity, like, it would be my dream to run a minor league baseball team for one year. I know I would get burned out after year one working 80 plus games every summer, but just the creativity, what you can do outside the box. You interviewed many guests on the Dallas sports through the years who've done amazing jobs throughout minor league baseball and major league baseball absolutely lacks that. There's like, it's such a dull, it's boring. Obviously I'm in Cleveland, go to a couple of Cleveland Indians games and I'm just bored out of my mind for nine innings sitting in the heat in the summer and baseball is just a slow sport in general besides playoffs. I mean, what is just like, what does Rob Mafford need to do to get people interested in baseball again? Well, I don't think it's just baseball. I could go NBA. I could go NBA DL. One of the things, NBA DL had one of the most unique things with the Bakersfield Jams because essentially they sold memberships. You couldn't get in after a certain amount. They made it 
a high class experience to where you were getting a buffet, you were hanging out with the players, you were doing all this crazy stuff. You know, it's funny. They were sold out when they went to the arena. They couldn't sell out at all. They couldn't even get close because not only too many seats, but they just there was no connectivity. The, the problem with a lot of these things is that they cut off all of the connectivity. Um, you know, one question I would have is why, why isn't every batting practice? Why really, why do you have batting practice? You have batting practice so kids can catch balls. So right. why don't you have a mini home run derby? Oh, really? No. Is it that hard? You do, all you have to do is put up the thing on the scoreboard. They choose not to, they choose not to do things like that because they are still thinking that 65 year old men are the way of the future. Mm -hmm. And the thing is, is I think, uh, you should have it where it's a Pokemon Go thing. You walk through the entire stuff. Here's where this ball was hit. Here's where this ball was hit. And guess what? You can pick up different points. Mm -hmm. If you don't make it fun, if you don't make it exciting, people people have better things to do. You know, and winning is not a good formula. I mean, I live in the worst sports fans in the world, which is Seattle, Washington, which, I mean, you know, the second the Seahawks didn't win, suddenly they were horrible and terrible and nobody wanted to go. It's amazing how they could win for 10 years. They don't win for one year. Suddenly everything's got to go. And that's the, you know, and just wait, we'll run out our stars as we always do. But that's, that's the biggest issue that people have is they don't make it fun. They don't try to make it to where if I go to it, wow, okay, this is a big deal. And, you know, it's, it's interesting because um, in college sports, it hasn't been the old time season ticket holders that have been leaving. It's been the students. If you look at the student scan ins, they're absolutely horrid. And the reason why is not just because you don't allow beer in the stands, but also because it's not very much fun. Like, you know, some of the, uh, some of the colleges used to have a lot of fun and now they don't at all. And now they go, then now they chastise the students for not wanting to show up for something they're already paying for with student fees. And suddenly that's their problem. Well, I think that's a you problem as the athletic director or whatever. That's a you problem. You know, that's funny. And that goes back to my Bowling Green University of Illinois game, sitting in meetings, trying to get students to the game, just like the same conversation. How do we get students? Do we pay? Do we get it? Like most millennials, Troy, now I could give two shits about going to any sporting event, a college game, professional game whatever they're so tied to their phones like the younger millennial generation z whatever you call them they they don't want to go to a game like our generation did like is that a problem is that a scarce for like the next like 10 20 30 years for sports marketers to figure out is it going to keep getting worse with attendance i think it's going to change what people focus on i think people love going to events if you notice with the lockdowns the first thing people did was go out to bars but they went out to bars that were fun if you if you think of anything that is fun, people will go out to it because as much as people think they like their phones, you know, there's only so much TikTok that you can watch. And it's also lonely and mental health wise, you need to go out with friends. But the difference is you're gonna go out to fun experiences. And there, you know, a lot of times I always used to marvel when I talk to group salespeople, they'd go, Well, you know, for the group leader, we give them some extra tickets. It's not what they want. They want, you know, give them a spa package, give them something opposite. And the problem is there's just not there, that bridge, that bridge of divide is just not there to be able to allow people to realize that they have to, you know, focus on how they make their stuff fun, how they make their stuff rewarding, the whole bit. And when you don't see it, you know, it doesn't take long for people to kind of evade it. Um, you know, people got money. People want to spend money. If you look at uh, Tiger Woods, Tiger Woods made stuff fun. Tiger Woods is no longer on the golf tour. Suddenly, you know, oh, John Daly is not really there. He's kind of there, but he's not. Right. But, I mean, if you look, it was not always just about winning. It was about somebody ripping a ball 400, 700 yards. And, you know, especially if they look like you and me, maybe more <laughs> like me. But, you know, and, you know, and drinking a beer. People want to see that. Spectacle matters. <clears throat> the people that want to make it out to where we're in a library, those are the boring people of life anyway. They weren't people you wanted to hang with. So why do you think that other people want to hang with them? For sure. You know, if I was, if I, if, honestly, and this is the thing that always got me, 
the most pretentious uh, folks that I ever met were in college women's basketball. And I was like, you need our help the most. You should be outrageous. Like, I mean, outrageous, like scary outrageous. It does not mean sex appeal. You know, I'm not saying degrade yourself, but I'm saying you should have, we should have Girl Scout cookie day where we unleash the Girl Scout cookies. That's the first day you can get them and have that be all around the arena. And we, even though we had the Girl Scout uh, stuff on board, it was hard to get folks that wanted to be a part of it because they act like somehow people should come out anyway. And it's like, that's not how people come out. People come out and you get them interested and you get them excited. And that's, I mean, that's about it. And I mean, I would, I would still do stuff for seniors. I, I mean, seniors and kids are who watch women's, college women's basketball. Not a bad thing, you know? So you got to have them at 2 p.m. sometimes, right? Those games. You're not having senior uh, services. You're not having different things that are out there. You could be having it where they get their, you know, contacts done at the same time or, you know, some type of massage therapy or whatever it is, you know, some kind of jazzercise. They're still watching your game, you know, but the problem is everyone thinks that you should just focus on their game 100% and never anything else. It's like that, that doesn't happen. You know, when I come back to the pocket gophers, I also had an e-gaming trailer because guess what? Kids don't want to watch, you know, 90 minutes complete of soccer. They want to watch five minutes. I don't care. I've got their money. They also want to have a big dumb ball that they roll around it uh, on the field, which by the way, I almost obliterated a kid accidentally because I didn't see him on the other end and just kind of stayed, you know, solid. The ball hit me and the kid, I hear this, well, <laughs> like <laughs> underneath, but see, that was still fun for the audience. Yeah. Um, you have to, you have to be able to do silly, stupid stuff. And I still don't get why people decided to get in the sports industry if they weren't to be stupid, because there's nothing that you're supposed to take seriously about this at all. I mean, if the pandemic didn't prove anything, nobody will give a crap if you're dead, uh, if LeBron scores 10,000 points. Mm -hmm. Nobody will. I mean, they might bring it up as a factoid, but mm -hmm. <laughs> and then they're dead. But, you know, have fun. And I don't think people do that enough. Can't agree with you more. And really glad we're diving into the semantics of just having fun at a sporting event and being create, creative because most professional teams are lacking it. And, and one of my pet peeves, why I really started Scouts Takes is, you know me, you, you, you've seen my content over the last, what, several years after I left the corporate world of really just the dysfunction between the primary and the secondary market, how you can go on StubHub, get a $90 ticket for $6 in most cases how these consolidators are, or most of them at least, are just crashing markets to $6 on stuff uh, below on Vivid and so forth. What are they really, hold on. Are they really crashing the markets? Yeah. Or is the market really inflated? Is the market really not something that it's always been, but yet I charge 90 bucks and then I get pissed off when somebody actually says, no, this is worth six. That's what I'm going to take. I think it's I, both. I, you know, because I mean, I, I love Curtis and you know Patrick and all them and they, they're not the they're not the reasons that these things have happened. They are the they are the person that is taking the actual resource that you have mispriced from the beginning, that you have said for some reason you know I don't know about you but I don't want to uh, sit in seven degree weather in Detroit Tigers second game of the season behind home plate and I don't want to pay ninety dollars. I maybe I'll pay six. You know I mean so. Is that really their fault? And by the way, if they're, if it's such a high value, mm -hmm. then why did we see the $3 tickets going on sale, you know, for all of the Angels games? Good including point. the one where they had the reigning, in, or the guy that was going to be MVP, you know, like pitching and hitting, and somehow those tickets are now only worth three bucks. Mm -hmm. <laughs> or, or the Chicago White Sox that are winning. I thought winning was going to cure all this. You got or Tony La Russa, and they're winning, and they're still throwing it for $3. Or to your point, like I mentioned back in September with the Anaheim Angels, why not have a special and charge $30 and let everyone take batting practice before a game if you can't sell that as a group asset and have more value and make $27 more per ticket instead of having a fire sale for $3 in that scenario? Once so, again, why, why is it that nobody uh, can sell enough group tickets to fill out stadiums, you know, in general? I mean, what, what, is, the, what is the issue there? I think – you know, and the other issue is, and I've always said this, I still don't understand why there are two ticket broker conferences at yeah. the same time in Las Vegas at two different hotels and all of these teams, which by the way, 
go when they're bad and they go and you know act like you know they're gonna like make a booty call because they're gonna go sell these tickets right why don't they just hold a fantasy draft and say you were the broker you were my broker here are my tickets there you go sell them till the sun goes down they don't do that they don't do that you know they i mean they use them back and forth and then that's where it creates uh, creates demand and price disparity because you don't know if the team wins suddenly you know the tickets four hundred dollars more and that if they're doing so great at it then hire them don't hire people to make stupid phone calls mm -hmm. you know if that's really what it is you know the breakdown of the phone call and the psychological and blah 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 mm -hmm. and you're trying to get people into season tickets so right now you know this the uh, seattle kraken have uh season tickets that people have all bought and now they're all trying to offload them because you know, the Kraken have like 15 losses because apparently you weren't supposed to ever lose. They mm -hmm. hyped up the team so much. Mm -hmm. And the thing is, I thought, you know, the Eli Wikis, all this stuff, they were supposed to be experts at this, especially at the secondary. You know what the difference is? They're not. All you've done is lock them into Ticketmaster, uh, you know, like they have to have a Ticketmaster account. Oh, so I can pay Ticketmaster a fee and you can pay a fee for us to exchange tickets that then you sell at half of the price. <laughs> how long do you think that shit's gonna last yeah i mean the only reason that concerts you know are the way they are is because they don't have the duopoly of having several concerts of the same concert right. you know you don't have the queen bee going to doing six different concerts in seattle oh, cool. in a three-week period so you can't flip them so you can't do all those things you have more demand in the concerts that makes sense yeah. We can debate about primary and secondary until the end of time. I can talk with you for eight hours on this podcast about that. But moving forward, a couple more questions. Obviously, going back to ticket reps, and obviously, I went through it, the inside sales, making pennies on the dollar, minimum wage plus commission. Trying to recruit an inside sales program in 2021, heading in 2022. Are these, is there demand, is there a problem with sports professional teams, college athletic departments, hiring reps for pennies of the dollar when they can go work for Amazon tech company, Salesforce, so many more options than we had back in the day, right out of college. Can I tell you what the problem is? Sure. Easy. They want you to be in the office. Right. If, if honestly, if you, you know, I had a person that was uh, looking to do this for a local chamber and I said, I'll do it, but I want to do it this way. No, we need you to do office hours. I don't get paid for office. Well, you need to make phone calls. No, I'd like to make sure that I'm actually, you know, visiting whatever. It's all about sales, right? Mm -hmm. They don't get that because at the end of the day, they want an administrative assistant who also handles all the other crap. You mentioned the fact that when you were at uh, Illinois, they'd have all these meetings about students. You don't get paid on student attendance. Exactly. You get paid on season tickets. You get paid on group tickets. You get paid on tickets, but they don't care because they think that somehow it has to adjoin that you being in the office. The great disruption, you know, in the United States has not been that people don't want to work. It's that the old timers that used to cut around the office who could have retired five years ago finally had no office for two years to retire to. So finally they did. That created a 3.5 million uh, person hole in all of the demand. So all of a sudden people are not going to work a lot of those burger jobs or whatever, because they don't have to, because there's suddenly a gap in employment. This happened in 1980 or 1998 as well. And if you look at all of those, when they try to hire for inside salespeople to go do this stuff, when it has been proven that you can do it digitally right. and you can price your tickets and do all those things. You know, I was, uh, you know, to be honest, we had, we had uh, really a horrible person that, you know, would make claims about what they were doing, talking, blah, blah, blah. At the end of the day, they would never actually make sales, but mm -hmm. they kept their job because they had a base. They have this huge base salary and it's like, why? Well, because, you know, we don't really like commissions. Commissions prove that you actually are selling. And that's the problem is people don't want to work up. People don't want to uh, hire on commission as much as they like to say, or they like to have a ceiling on it, or people don't want to work just on commission base. Because if they did, you know, insurance salesmen, by the way, seem to do pretty well. They don't even really have a base a lot of times, but you know the difference is they're not in the office. Exactly. They don't stay in the office after that test is done. They don't have a chance. 
They're at every little thing, you know, known to man. They have as many cards as possible and they are out. And the thing is, they don't have somebody over their shoulder asking what they're doing because that person is out. Very and when well. you do have that, the problem is you have somebody that wants you as an office body and they somehow think you're going to magically make sales and they need somebody to blame when you don't make sales. Boy, did you hit that nail on the head there, Troy? Man, we're going to have to like repeat that in a highlight segment at some point. That was absolutely. And a couple other more questions, one and a half more questions before we let you go. Number one, kind of a hot take. Who's your best guest ever on the sports dial? And like, what are you up to now? You're like a restaurant owner. You own a team. I mean, you're doing a bunch of things. You were in politics. Like, what's going on now? Well, uh, first off, I would never pick, uh, you know, like a special one because they all have unique things. Sure. Uh, you know, I know that sounds like cliche or it sounds like a cop out. But, you know, like I like John Spolstra, but there were people, Dan Bolston. Was a group, it turned into a great friend of mine out of Purdue. I mean, there are just, there are just people that you meet because of the fact that instead of uh, me focusing on their title and thinking that's why or that's a get, um, it to me means that I get more out of the entire situation. And I always learn from everybody. So I, I think I actually received more than a lot of the other people. I, I got to be selfish. So it, it worked for me. Um, in terms of what I'm doing now, you know, I've got a bunch of various ventures. At one point, um, I ran a uh, family fun center for about two years, which was crazy. Yeah, that, we, we changed that over. Um, I, the, um, I have a white label ticket company, so we'll do like comedy shows and stuff. And people won't believe that I won't take the actual ticket income, you know, whatever, because I'll get the service fee. Well, I also get the data. They don't understand that the data is more important. So oh. all these guys are like, hey, I'll do a show. Great. You make a lot of money, but you lose the data. Um, I have vending machines and like laundromats. I, you know, um, I worked at the state legislature for two years in the House of Representatives, uh, working on marketing of videos and everything. And then um, there's a local public affairs station. And I did 49 episodes uh, where I covered the state legislature in 2020. Um, just Great. Can't even keep now, um, one thing uh, I do is uh, I, I will say I'm uh, most proud of being on the Lacey uh, Parks Board as commissioner. We got 51 sharps boxes which hold needles into, and so they're all in uh, you know bathrooms and that kind of stuff. Um, so I own the Cider Barrel, and it is um, a small shop downtown. It's only 600 square feet, but because of that, I get to do different things. So I have. 379 hard ciders. We focus on women. I got to do a cider fest with 350 people. It's funny. Everyone says COVID, 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 COVID doesn't matter. You just got to have fun. Yeah. I built a cider van with eight taps on the side. Um, we uh, door dash alcohol. So this is the other thing, the amount of things that you can do beyond. So I get uh, people locally go, I don't understand how you're only open Friday, Saturday, Sunday. It's like I door dash alcohol at night. Like I just hand it off to people. Yeah. And like I make more money and everyone goes, well, I thought DoorDash shouldn't make you money. You just overprice it. No one cares. It's alcohol. And then uh, we have uh, pre-sold wine that we do with wine clubs and that kind of stuff. Uh, because with the Cider Barrel, I have uh, the restaurant license. I have restaurant pricing. So it makes it easier for me to do. So this is a lot of fun stuff. But, you know, the one thing I've learned from all this, though, is, you know, when I started NATSO, which is a ticket association or sports sales boot camp. I did not do it alone. And that's the big thing. So, you know, it's like uh, Natso is Carrie Neville taking my call or Jason Martin or, you know, uh, Matt Harper or Aaron Dunn or Joe Rickson and them actually starting it. So you get a lot of credit or more credit if you actually do it with other people, you know, and that's where I would have to say is the difference is if you're not uh, focused on the fact that other people have helped you, you're probably the bad apple, you know? So. <laughs> and I, I look at it that way. So if, if you're just a me guy and, you know, pumping up your chest because you're the athletic director, you're the president or whatever, and then you can't really name all the people that, you know, helped you get there or, you know, basically were the reason you got there, that's on you. You know, I think that's not, a, that's not on me. That's on you. So, yeah. So, but it's been fun. Um, I, you know, the, I will tell you, I won Entrepreneur of the Year of, uh, in 2019 at the Lacey South Sound Chamber. 
And I just thought that was cool. Cause I was like, wow, okay. So it's like getting, getting an award for no reason. So, you know. Dude, I can, I can, you're a serial entrepreneur doing like 24,000 different things. I mean, that, that that's awesome. I didn't realize you, you were, you're just all over the place, man. That That's awesome. You're staying busy. You have multiple businesses. What yeah. all, of, all we should strive to do as entrepreneurs as me as a new entrepreneur for the last year or so, like I never want to go back to work for the man ever again. Well, be- here, here's the thing I'll tell you is uh, when I got uh, pushed out um, of Davis, I, for a little bit, I felt really bad, but I was like, well, I'm in sports. And then I did my own conference up in Seattle for two years and right. I had like two, 300 people. Mm-hmm. I said, I'm in sports. I'm just not in the same sports that they are. Right. You know, it's, I would have handled it differently, uh, but the uh, person that, you know, was the incoming athletic director felt threatened because he had touted himself at a Pac-12 school as being this ticket guru. And then um, when he came in, I think, you know, because for two and a half months he was there, he would not meet with me or neither with the deputy director. So I just kind of assumed. And one day I just kind of got the whole, oh, it's not us, it's you. Uh, okay. And, you know, so I left. And what was funny was I was still the president of, uh, NATSO. So I went to the NACTA conference, which I always had to pay for because they'd never pay for professional development. <laughs> and uh, what was great is I mentioned Dan Bolston. And so I was telling him and he goes, okay, look around you. There's 10,000 people at this conference. If I went around and asked who the athletic director of UC Davis is right now, nobody would know. But if I asked who the ticket guy is, everybody know. knows. <laughs> yeah. And you know, what's funny is like, you, you look now that that guy is not even in athletic season or even handling tickets, handling Canada golf or something. I just look at that and I go, you know, those people feel threatened and they feel that uh, there's some kind of power that they have over you. Like they're going to threaten you or blackball you. I always love that concept. People are going to blackball you from the industry. You know what? Um, You couldn't do anything about Larry Nacer. I don't think you're going to do anything about me. I haven't done (laughs) shit. You know, (laughs) like, like some of you people that blindly looked past horrible people that did horrible things to horrible people. I haven't done anything even remotely close. So I think I think I'm probably okay. You know what? A, what an interview. I mean, you guys I mean, get your pop. I probably damaged about fifty relationships just on this. But you know, if I did, then you know, hopefully I'll finally hear from them. Who knows? I'm okay with it. Um, you know, Scott, been a pleasure. I really wish you would have come on. I will tell you in your defense. I did always advocate to, you know, two of your bosses and kind of go, you know, that's more of a blind spot on you than them. And that was a, that was something that got me kicked out of one of the suites in Atlanta. So we'll go from that. But anyway, I'll talk to you later. Cool. Thank, Thank you for coming on. Best of luck to you. Great catching up. And yeah. make sure. I'll let you say my tagline. Say it if you know it. Some people don't know it. I don't know. Oh, man, Troy, you're going to be on a blooper video. Stay lean and clean, my friends. Okay, there you go. Yeah. Awesome. My tagline, say it if you know it. Some people don't know it. I don't know. Oh, man, Troy, you're going to be on a blooper video. Stay lean and clean, my friends. Okay, there you go. Yeah.